from Microbe TV. This is Office Hours for Wednesday, June 21st, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and welcome to our corner of the internet where you can learn about viruses and have nice chats with your friends. Excuse me. <clears throat> welcome, everyone. I want to Welcome our moderators for this evening. I see Barb Mack, UK, where it's quite late, I'm sure. Uh, I see Andrew from New Zealand. I see Tom from Wisconsin. Thank you. And Les just popped in. Thank you all for being here and moderating. <clears throat> I have a few things to um, talk about before we jump into your questions. Yes, I am wearing a spike shirt. They are it's hidden behind the microphone. See, yeah, I love it. And you know, it's like twenty-two Celsius here in the New York area. So I'm wearing. I love the long sleeve. I actually wear long sleeves all summer. I never wear short sleeve shirts. I don't know why. <clears throat> Later, after this, I'm going to do some treadmilling, and I'm going to wear this, and it it's really good. All right, um, <clears throat> the genome bar. Had this uh, Nels today on Tuivo said, you know, when DNAs get together, they, they exchange sequences. And I thought, oh, when, when DNAs get together, that could be the genome bar. And a, a lot of people liked it. A few people liked it. So uh, I'm not going to open a bar in my lifetime. That's not in the cards for me. But if I were in a city and I saw the genome bar, man, I'd go in for sure, right? And... Um, Maybe I should make the corner of the incubator the genome bar. So if you visit in the evening, we can have a drink. <clears throat> All right, that's the genome bar. Second on my list, and by the way, I am reading from my field notes, courtesy of Jan here on, on the stream. And um, for the first time in a long time, I, uh, I have them with me. I actually made some notes on the train. Second, many of you have no doubt seen or heard this miserable hours-long podcast of Joe Rogan with RFK Jr., right? <clears throat> Where the, the only thing of truth is when they introduce themselves and say their names, I think. So this is just chock full of nonsense. Uh, Dan Wilson contacted me and he said, you should do a debunk on... Um, Twib because he's listened to all three hours and he could give me his notes. And I said, I don't want to do it by myself. I want you to join me. So he's coming on to Twib and we're going to debunk the whole bloody thing. <clears throat> I'm going to try and get as many of my Twib co-hosts as possible to join, but it's going to be an odd time, probably on weekends because that's when uh, is best for Dan. I have no issue whatsoever recording on weekends. And, um, People say, well, why do you want to work all the time? It's not work. I told you it's not work. So look for an upcoming debunking of this garbage Rogan RFK Jr. Oh, my God. <clears throat> this is what I like to do. I can pivot and do stuff on a dime, right? So look for that in, a, in the next couple of weeks. Speaking of Instagram... Why, how was I speaking of it? I said something that reminded me of it. I don't remember. <clears throat> uh, I've been getting a thrashing lately on Instagram. Not justifiably, in my opinion. If I deserve a thrashing, I will accept it. If I say something wrong, I will say I'm wrong. But of course, after we released, it came from nature, not a lab, our TWIV in Philadelphia. We get the usual thrashing. Yeah, it may have come from nature, but it was certainly tweaked in a lab. Give me a break. Just just don't talk to me because you're wasting breath. What you're saying has zero credibility, and you have zero credibility. Now, and then there was another thing I got thrashed for, for espousing my philosophy about what science is. Oh my gosh, a person said, I'm leaving TWIV. What is this crap when you don't agree with someone, you you leave or you take back whatever it is you gave them? What, what is this vindictiveness that's crept into society? Oh my gosh, it's horrible. So I have to complain, folks, because you're my community here 
And um, it really bothers me, but I'm muscling on or shouldering on whatever the thing is. Thrashing. That's thrashing on Instagram. <laughs> uh, what's next? Uh, in I was in Houston this past weekend for ASM Microbe, which is a big meeting. Many, many thousands of people celebrating microbiology. Very little virology, but we did a twim and a twiv. Oh my gosh, wait till you hear the twim. You have to listen to this one because it's Mimi Goldschmidt, who's 97 years old, a retired microbiologist. Uh, she has a TikTok moment which is amazing. She was doing a lab where she had to collect urine. Each student had to collect urine. So she brings the urine to the, to the prof in a, in a little beaker. And he looked at her, he goes, how did you get that into that small beaker? And she said, I used a really big funnel. Oh my God, this 97 year old lady is just cracking up up there. There's the last thing she said. Isn't that a great one? And then we did a twiv with Eddie Holmes. So that'll be fun to look for. Eddie is so eloquent. And I'll take more of a thrashing for that one. That'll come out this weekend. Uh, coming up on Tuesday, ASV. Well, ASV starts on Saturday. <clears throat> but um, Tuesday, we're doing the twiv. So if you're going to be at ASV, you should check it out at 12.15. Um, our guest is going to be Trevor Bedford. Yeah, the, the guy who was doing genomics out in Washington at the beginning of the pandemic. Very cool. Looking forward to hear his story. We'll have Kathy, myself, and Brianne there. And uh, one more thing, two more things I want to tell you. First of all, a couple of weeks ago, there was a symposium at <clears throat> oh wait, before i get off um asm let me just show you this here this is a, a picture that was taken by ray ortega i'm signing a book of this is the vida smith a uh, microbiology professor in texas san antonio i've known her for many years <clears throat> she says she just won a book at the ASTEM books, I ran over to get my autograph. And this is funny. Ray Ortega says, working with Prof VRR this week. Seen here signing autographs. There's a rock star in every niche podcasting. Isn't that great? I love it. It's ASM. Oh, by the way, uh, let me show you. <clears throat> yeah, this is a nice stage that Ray Ortega put together for... <clears throat> recording Twim and Twiv and a lot of other things that they record. Really nice stage. Uh, but I have to tell you, in, in, 2000, in 2009, we did, Ray and, and Chris Kondayan, we did live TWIV at an ASM meeting in Philadelphia. It was, it was like the first time they'd ever attempted to do, to do something like that live. And it, there was one person in the audience. And since then, of course, it's become very popular. They have a stage now, and they have it's almost continuous. But Twiv was a pioneer. I'm pretty proud about that. I really like that. Okay, <clears throat> what else do I want to tell you? All right, the, there was a symposium a couple of weeks ago. I should probably get this on the uh, YouTube page. So posing a couple of weeks ago in honor of Koistya Chumakov, who um, retired from the FDA uh, at the end of last year. And actually, he was he worked on polio much of his career. And um, Amy actually took over his laboratory. She took his position. Anyway, I, I had Chris Kondayan record, <clears throat> record the entire... Um, Symposium, and I'm releasing the uh, videos uh, over the next few days. The first one was part one. There, uh, there's his, this course, and it's a, a compilation video made up of talks by me, Paul Offit, Raul Andino, Olin Q, and Phil Miner. It's fabulous. Like if no more than 20 minutes each. These are science talks. They're talking about the history of polio. Part two I released today, which is kind of a history of, of uh, Chumakov. Chumakov. Uh, worked, got his PhD in the Soviet Union with Vadim Agol. He's in the upper right there. 
And um, in the same lab was Sasha Gorbalenya, who's below him. And then below to the left is Ann Palmenberg, who, who wasn't there but in that lab, but reminisces about him as well. You know, it turns out that Eugene Kunin got his PhD with uh, Kostya Chumakov in, in the Soviet Union. I think that's really cool. So check those videos out, okay? Those are good. I know they're not getting a lot of views. You know, people don't like to listen to hard stuff. I understand, but come on, just listen. This crowd here, you're going to like them. Uh, they're all good stories, okay? YouTube. Chumakov uh, <clears throat> uh, Symposium. All right, now one last thing. As you heard Paul Offit on Beyond the Noise the other day, the FDA has asked its advisory board uh, which <laughs> monovalent booster to approve. They approved, not approved. They said, we sh you should use XBB.1.5. Monovalent booster. And now it goes to the CDC, which will make the, make the recommendation for uh, the rest of the U.S. And as you will hear, he says, you know, this is not for everyone, although it probably is going to be recommended for everyone. It um, will probably be best for people 75 and up, as at-risk people, people with comorbidities, immunosuppressed, and so forth. So do listen to Beyond the Noise. It's only 10 minutes. Really, it's nothing. I'm, I'm surprised it's not getting more uptake. Oh, well. Now, <clears throat> Pete had asked a question uh, which disappeared, and I could just uh, answer it again, uh, ask it again. I, don't, I haven't answered it yet. Yeah, let me ask, let me go to the other stream that I have here. So Pete said, hmm, yeah, you can't watch live. So here goes off. It said the new XBB monovalent vaccine would be considered a new product. Why wouldn't the yearly flu vaccine be considered a new product as well? Well, here's the reason. Nearly flu vaccine is really tweaked. It's basically a three or four component vaccine, two A's and one or two B's. And they just tweak the components every year. So what are we doing with this XBB.1.5? It's a monovalent vaccine. First, So the original was monovalent, so that's fine. We've gone from a bivalent, which should have also been a new product, according to, to Paul. But this is really different from the ancestral virus. It's more different. So oh, this XBB.1.5 is more different from the ancestral SARS-CoV-2, Washington or, or Wuhan, whatever. It would be Wuhan because that's what the vaccine was, was sequence was based on. It's really different, and the flu vaccines are not that different from year to year. They're only t tiny amino acid changes, so they don't need to be new products. Whereas this is really different than new product, and there's no, there's very little data on this. As Paul said, there's a little bit of mouse data, so that's why it's the case. Okay, and then Polio Pete also asking, and I'll I'll answer this because he's not here. True or false, with SARS-CoV-2, we're selecting new variants for the vaccine, and with flu, we're selecting old variants. No, we're, we're not selecting old variants. There are variants that have arisen in the recent past, right, in the case of flu and uh, SARS-CoV-2. So they're, they're past, arisen, they're circulating variants. Now, it, it, for flu, they're circulating in the southern hemisphere. And the prediction is that they're going to come up, right? They don't always come up or not. The same one doesn't always come up. So in that sense, it's different because, yes, for SARS-CoV-2, they are already circulating. The, the thing is here, this monovalent XBB.1.5, by, by September, it may not be circulating anymore. It may have been displaced or it may be displaced very quickly. So it could be a similar situation to influenza. Who knows? Anyway. You can listen to Beyond the Noise to decide if you want to get one or not. I'm not getting one. I've had three vaccines and infection, and I, I think I'm good until I see data that this is going to help. So what this will do, XBB1.1.5, you'll get antibodies against 
it for a few months. You'll be nicely protected even against uh, mild disease. But who knows what's going to be circulating? Maybe what's circulating is totally different and it's not going to make any difference. But in the end, what will protect you are your T-cells, which remain largely unchanged from ancestral through all the variants up until now and probably in the future. So whether we change the vaccine or not, that protection would still be there. Okay, so I got to Polio Pete's uh, question. Uh, people were talking about Brianne, I guess Jeopardy, okay. I thought David Quammen was going to be a guest tomorrow. Not on here. Did I ever say that? <clears throat> I bet he would do a live stream. Office hours, folks. Boy, that would be a treat. Do you want to get David Quammen on office hours? Come on, let's get some enthusiasm here. I, I don't mean to be a pushy guy, but David Quammen for office hours. He might do it. So let's see. When it's 8 o'clock here, it's like, what, 6 there? Yeah, he would do it maybe for an hour. Yes? Okay. I will move on and we'll, we'll get to it. Uh, Andrew is using AI to generate images of viruses. How, wh what are you using? What app are you using? Tell me. I would like to do that also. I think it would be fun. Yep. Uh, Tom, um, thanks for being here. Originally, you were not going to be. Virology 2022 was a peak experience. <laughs> That's the ASV 2022. Yeah, that would be fun. <clears throat> that was fun, excuse me. All right, so now principal manager is doing Jeopardy. It's the much debated theory that scientific research led to the COVID-19 outbreak. What is the lab leak hypothesis? Yeah, when it comes to viruses, you have to get up pretty early to, to, to fool me. Oh, actually, polio pizza question was here. So let's bring it up so that it can be part of the permanent stream. That's it. We've already answered that. Okay. <laughs> Many people in uh, Europe where it's like 2 a.m. or what is it now? 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. Yeah. And many of them were on Twivo this afternoon. So good for you. <clears throat> And here's the other question of polio peats. I don't know why I didn't think these would, would be up. <clears throat> Sorry for the, the throat. I just had dinner. And, you know, sometimes after you eat, you have a little congestion. Yeah, I guess if you're allergic to what you ate, right? Very cold in Sydney. Speaking of Sydney, I'm sorry to say I'm not going to be visiting Australia in the fall as I had planned. I was asked by... Uh, I was asked by a company who which will not be named to do a three-week speaking tour to Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. And I decided, you know, Microbe TV is not at the point where I can just take off for three weeks and it will hum along on its own. It will basically grind to a halt. And I know they have internet in, in Australia, but it's very, it's very difficult to not just record remotely but post because moving big files around... Um, <clears throat> it's hard with slow internet, so I'm not going. I'll go another time, though. You bet. Uh, John, I really like the symposium and Beyond the Noise. The story about plumbing in the early 1900s and the shift in polio is so intriguing. <clears throat> yeah. A disease of modern sanitation should uh, listen to them. They're good. Okay, question. Did Moderna or Pfizer share the 50 human subjects for the new booster? No, Moderna just did. Uh, they had no data from Pfizer, according to Paul. Didn't you say that? 
maybe maybe he said that only Moderna did mouse studies. I don't know. You don't share subjects now. If if they did both did phase ones, and they're not going to do phase ones anyway. Maybe small safety study, just like they do with flu. But uh, let me just plead ignorance. I take all that back. I don't know what I'm talking about. But you wouldn't share human subjects anyway. Uh, making waves, lab leakers are now talking about you and your programs. Good for them. Let them talk. I, I understand I was mentioned in uh, Alina Chan's book. Good. Let them mention. Let me tell you something. Not a lot of people that have worked on viruses for 40 years, run a research lab, and wrote about them, done podcasts. I'm not saying I know everything, but I'm thoughtful. The lab leakers don't know squat. And, you know, we were thinking of having one on TWIV, and then we canned it because they don't have any data, and TWIV is about data, with the exception of, you know, an author here and there, Andy Slavitt, who didn't have any data. Um, we, we are mostly data-driven, so I, I don't want to have lab leakers who have no data. You know what? If a lab leaker, they're not going to come up. And, you know, by the way, they don't like that I call them lab leakers. Well, tough. Do something productive with your life, and I won't call you a lab leaker. It's non-productive for you to do this stuff. If they come up, if someone had data saying, oh, look, there's an outbreak of COVID in the Wuhan Institute of Virology before everything else, I would look at it. I'd reconsider. But there's no data. There is no. It's just speculation. So, boom. Principle is I'm agnostic to lab leak or zoological spillover. How can a disaster like this be mitigated no matter the source? Well, in principle, don't be agnostic, okay? Because that's part of the problem. When you say, oh, I don't care if it started in a lab or, or uh, in nature, that gives credence to a lab leak, and you shouldn't do that. Well, you could do whatever you want, but it doesn't make me very happy. How can it be mitigated? Be ready, it, like we weren't. Have antivirals, which we could have had, but nobody wanted to pay for them. Why? Because the whole world revolves around bloody money and profits. That's the problem. And no company wanted to make antivirals for a coronavirus because eh, SARS-1 ended after 8,000 cases. MERS, it's a few thousand cases total, a few a month. No problem. And the NIH said, nah, we're not going to fund any of that stuff. So we're all screwed because of people being cheap. Complain to your Congress people about that. That's how you can mitigate it. You could also make p PCR tests that work out of the gate. You could, say, not have a central agency do all the testing. You could have enough excess hospital capacity. You could have enough masks. You could be bloody ready. And now, you know what, folks? I'm really sorry to say we're not going to be ready for the next one because the, all this stuff gets forgotten. People go back to playing political games, using public health to get them votes. It's just ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Hmm. Ah, Lise wore her spike shirt to work out. That's right. So am I. I decided at 10 p.m. I'm going to treadmill, even though it's kind of late, because I feel so good after I treadmill. We need to do this. We're, we're, and Elizabeth is wearing this short sleeve version. What's up with today? We are all with it. We're all with it. Huh. Do virologists know what the oldest virus is or what the oldest viruses are? Do we know why they've survived so long? So I need some clarification here. Do you mean the, when was the oldest virus in evolutionary history? Well, then when the first cells arose, there were viruses ready to infect them, which would be billions of years ago, right? As soon as the earth cooled and we had self-assembling chemicals evolving and then the first cell, viruses went into the cells. So many, 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 many years ago. But what you probably mean is what's the oldest virus that scientists have ever recovered, right? Right. And I think that would go to these giant viruses recovered from Siberian permafrost. These ice cores that are taken in Siberia for other purposes, um, that you can get a little bit of that. And Jean-Michel Claverie and Chantal Abergel at 
at Marseille Université. They have recovered giant viruses, 35, 40,000 years old. It's probably the oldest ones we've ever recovered. And they're, they're frozen, so that's why they remain infectious. It's like putting them in the freezer, right? There you go, I think. Hello, Jessica from University of Toledo. How are you? It's good to have you here. Hmm. I commented on the recent check-in with Dr. G that he de detailed the study from the UK on the spread of SARS-2, but your reaction, I thought, was to minimize it. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I probably did. I think there are, I, I don't remember what I said, but uh, well, f as you know, I'm not in favor of that challenge study to begin with. I think it's unethical. And um, I think the conclusions were minimal, uh, seeing how the, the experimental design was. But they're going to go ahead with, with more. So good luck to them. Where did you comment on this Patricia, let me know. I'd love to see it. Can't bring myself to listen to Joe Rogan. Yeah, I, I, you know, <laughs> Dan listened to all three hours. I probably will have to because I want to take clips where they say something and put that in our stream and then we will say why this is complete and utter nonsense. And then we'll get trashed. By people who say, oh, someone said to me, oh, Vincent, tell me how many patents you have for polio virus. So what do you, what do you think, that I'm doing this for money? First of all, I haven't made a dime off of any patent. And all my patents are expired. I had a patent on transgenic mice, bomb, nothing, nothing from that. I had a, a patent on infectious polio virus DNA, bomb, nothing from that. I didn't patent them. The universities that I worked for patented them. Not a, not a penny. I hate patenting things. In fact, I wish we hadn't patented the transgenic mice because now the ones that are being used globally are used are, are competitors who didn't patent them. So good job, Columbia. Despise patents. So to think that picking on me for patents is going to work to get me all riled up, <laughs> no, not happening. Hmm. Um, well, Questella, I'm sorry you don't open Instagram, but if you did, you could see, you could just follow me and you could see pictures of when I'm doing stuff. But if you're not interested, that's fine. I, I had, there are enough, there are a good number of people, or I should say there are a number of good people there following who are really interested and seeing what I'm doing and so forth. We post all the thumbnails of all the episodes and then I post photos here and there of me uh, doing things on the road. So it's fun. But yeah, it can be toxified, right? Les says, the Kennedy family has made it clear they don't like his nonsense and he is besmirching their name. Well, I don't know how far that's going to go. But um, he look at everyone, every politician that is, is either pushing lab leak or anti-vax. It's all to get votes. That's it. And, and to make money, of course. And in my opinion, to, to use public health to get votes, to use people's lives to get votes, is, what, what's a strong word I can use to describe it? It's a tragedy. You're killing people to get votes. How can you sleep at night? I don't get it. I don't get it. Hmm. I like this. Why do people need to announce their departures? It's not an airport. I think, Bridget, because they think I'm going to get all upset and start begging them to come back, or maybe I'll just get mad and look like a fool. I don't know. I would never say that. I disagree with you, so I'm leaving. But first of all, I mean, normal social discourse... You have a disagreement. Um, you work it out, or maybe you don't want to talk about it. That's fine, too. But you don't say, I'm leaving. I've had so many people say, 
I'm withdrawing my support from Patreon because I don't I don't like this episode. I don't like where you're going with this. You know, folks, it comes with the territory. <laughs> the person on Instagram who was leaving twice is an undergrad. She is idealistic. Well, you know, I didn't say anything that was offensive in any way. I said that science um, is not a job. It is a passion. It is not a right to do science. You have to earn it. And if you don't like that, I don't care because it's the truth. You know, you think, oh, I'd like to be a scientist, so I should be. No, that's not, it doesn't work that way. You have to earn it, which means you have to be trained properly and work hard. And then when you do science, you're not going to get paid a lot. You're going to get paid less than all your friends. And that's because it's not about money. It's about changing the world. I think saying that science is about changing the world is pretty damn cool. And I don't know why you wouldn't like that. So goodbye. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Yep. Don't get upset. People like that don't care about science. I, I'm fine now that I've let it out here in my little uh, community. Uh, I know, I, but you know, you guys are all good supporters, although you you don't hesitate to be critical or disagree. That's fine. That's the way discourse works, right? But, you know, back when I was saying there's no evidence that the variants are any more transmissible, and some of you disagreed, I get a little annoyed, but I didn't say, get off of my stream. You didn't say I'm leaving because you're saying this. We just have a discourse. We agree to disagree, right? Okay. 97 and on TikTok. Yeah, I'm going to make a TikTok out of that. I used a big funnel. Oh, you should have seen her face when she said that. It was just precious. And these are the moments you hope that people say. <laughs> Joe Rogan, further evidence we are living in the golden age of stupidity. You know, um, I'm not sure everyone is that stupid. I think playing stupid sells, okay? I, I think a lot of people are just ignorant. They don't know anything. I mean, Rogan doesn't know anything. You know what really ticks me off? I won't get mad, but I was on Lex Friedman, remember? Because you guys told him to have me on. He had me on. He told Rogan to have me on and Rogan would have none of it because I'm just going to say the truth and Rogan doesn't want the truth. He wants he wants uh, spectacular lies that blow up, you know, gets millions of listens. I can get millions of listens with Vincent. Hmm. You're not going to ASV? Okay, next year. Next year it's closer to you. It's in uh, Columbus, Ohio. So you go walk. <laughs> uh, Rach from the Isle of Man I saw there on again about it being a lab leak on Russell Brand's podcast he has so much clout in the UK and I feel your annoyance at this ludicrous misinformation it's ludicrous because <laughs> there's no evidence whatsoever it's just it could be this or it could be that it's it's it, ludicrous is a good word but you know they, they're drowning us out <laughs> <laughs> look at me looking snazzy. I don't know, I've just got a t-shirt on and my usual blue glasses. It's not so snazzy. Oh, okay. Questel is now binging, binging, sorry, binging my Instagram. Yeah, there's a lot of posts. Thousands of posts going way back. Okay. Oh, I just got a text from Amy. Hi, Amy. How's it going? Ooh, look at this. All right, Vincent, you are amazingly knowledgeable, patient, and kind as an educator. Peter Hotez declined to debate RFK Jr. on Rogan for 100000 to the charity of Hotez's choice. That's a good decision. You know, you don't debate in science. Science is not a debate. Go debate politics where people's opinions can be swayed. But science, you get the results of experiments, and then you make a conclusion derived from the data. Sometimes there's a little wiggle room, right? You can say, oh, this could mean this or that. But you don't debate it. Because both sides probably agree, yeah, it could be this or that. You write a paper, you say, we think it's this, but it could also be this. There's no nothing to debate. What is it? Someone said something really good about debating just takes away the 
the the aspect of science that's factual or something like that. I, I wish I had written it down. It was really good. Anyway, that's part one of three. Two of three. You don't owe it to anyone to do this, but if any public educator could debunk RFK on Rogan, I think it's you. You have the potential to change thousands of minds. I don't think so. I don't think I would change anyone's mind. They would say he's a he's an academic. He's paid by big pharma. He gets money for this and that, you know, and they would just I say, eh, yeah, it's the same old, same old. So I, I appreciate your confidence, but I don't think uh, it would change anyone's mind. Vincent, Amy dismissed my first question here hard. I learned from it. She was right. I didn't leave and try to learn where I may disagree with you mostly on minor points. Well, you shouldn't leave. You shouldn't get insulted if someone tells you they're wrong, even if they're wrong. Try and you know, just calm down. Take a deep breath, right? I mean, I, I rant, right? I get upset here clearly, but I'm not leaving. All right, Heather, part three of three. You would need Dan Wilson to help you look at all the studies, RFK sites, to tease apart his dozens of incorrect interpretations and claims, but worth it for 100,000 towards vaccine science or to have... Um, First of all, if he if he gave a million to Microbe TV, I might think about it ahead of time. In the bank, confirmed ahead of time, then I might think about it. But, um, yes, everything he says is BS. The only thing he could say that might be right about vaccines harming people is the oral polio vaccine can cause paralysis. But he probably doesn't even know that because all he knows are falsities, <laughs> wrong things, okay? So, uh, so the symposium videos, yes, those were captured from, so we, we recorded it with, I brought my microbe TV studio cameras down to the symposium, really high quality cameras, and we used those. <laughs> we used those. This is pretty. I'm laughing because Catamus Rex says I look like a beat poet. Yeah, maybe a little bit. <laughs> That's very funny. I like that. Hmm. Uh, Difference Guide has a recipe for a DNA cocktail. I think it will try it and report back. You could serve it at the Genome Bar. Yeah, I have to set up a little bar in the corner and put a neon sign above it that says Genome Bar. Right, right there, where DNAs get together. <laughs> I so like that idea. It's you know we have some good ideas on these streams. Mm. I saw the greatest minds of my generations pulled down by anti-vaxxers. John, could you please elaborate? Okay, I really want to know what you're talking about. Summer is the best time to do niche stuff on YouTube as the viewing figures drop off. So so great to attract people who are interested in hard topics. By the way, we just passed 121,000 subscribers on YouTube. See that? 121,000. It takes about a month, a month and a half to get 1,000 subscribers. So you can do the math. <laughs> you can... Tell me how long it's going to take. It's going to be 12000 a year, roughly, right? And I'm never going to reach a million subscribers unless the rate of accrual of new um, su subscribers changes, right? Because I'm assuming the rate is going to be a constant 1000 a month. But it's very possible that the more you get, the faster they accumulate, right? We could calculate that. We could use calculus <laughs> to figure that out. Anyway, I plan to do some, uh, I have July, most of July and, and most of August, no travel. I'll be around the incubator. I don't want to make a bunch of videos, you know, uh, short things outside of the podcast. So if you're in town, visit the incubator. It would be fun. I'd like to see you. You've been loving beyond the noise. I'm glad you like it. Someone said, I wish it were longer. And I appreciate that. But the point was to make a short product that people could watch very quickly and get the essence. Because I think 
Paul delivers the essence quite succinctly, and I help tease it out, I think. Yep. Beyond the Noise is exactly the concise information that should be coming from CDC and FDA. I, I don't know why they can't do it. Oh, I'm not. A, I'm not uh, insulted by being called a beat poet. I I knew. I mean, I, I went to school uh, at Cornell, and Richard Farina went to Cornell, right? Allen Ginsberg. I j I know those two. That's it. <laughs> are flu vaccines FDA approved? Yeah, they are. And. Doesn't matter. Yeah, they, they, they should be put by the FDA. There is a limited amount of safety data and immunogenicity that's done every time they, they change the flu vaccine. And, and yes, that should be done for sure. Does the spike from Delta still work? What, what do you mean, does it work? Oh, as a vaccine. I, I think spike would not give you antibodies against... <clears throat> Excuse me, um, uh, Omicron subvariants. No, nope. Okay, reactivation, reactivating latent virus in, in long COVID. Is this seen in other post acute syndromes? I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I'm going to write it down in my trusty book for Daniel because tomorrow is Daniel's. Clinical update. Daniel Griffin, is uh, herpes virus reactivation seen in other long uh, long syndromes? Yeah, this post viral syndromes. It's a good question. I put it on the agenda last week. I popped in a question from Polio Pete, so I have the ability to do that. <laughs> of course, it's it's have the ability to do that of course I will ask him Lori because I just don't know uh, Carol our favorite nephrologist beyond the uh, would a six month old infant need two or three COVID vaccines what, do you think? what is, this, is the recommendation I don't even know does someone know uh, what they're going to do is it going to be just one you know, with the bivalent, they were saying we want. So, so if you, um, let's see, yeah. So, an infant who's never been infected, never had any vaccines. Um, how many shots would you get? So, let's let's check it out. XBB dot one dot five. How many doses for infants? I'm not going to get an answer to that. Because it's too new. Seems to me you should have at least two, but I don't know what, uh, you know. Uh, so basically, Carol, that's up to the CDC to recommend. Because that's what Paul said. He said, we don't, he hoped that they weren't going to recommend it for everyone. So the number of doses is going to be up to the CDC, uh, which will be soon. So um, you have to wait and see because I don't think anyone knows. All right, it looks like everyone wants David Quammen. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll, uh, I'm sure he would do it. Um, we have a good rapport. Yeah, uh, I will ask him. Definitely, I think it would be fun. And you got to promise me, folks, to ask him questions. Don't let him sit here without questions. I'm just kidding. I know you would ask questions. All right. Nicola wants to hear Paul off his opinion on long COVID. In my opinion, that's the big issue now. If 1% of the vaccinated people that get mild COVID go on to develop long COVID, it seems a big problem to me. I, I agree. I asked him that the last time he was on TWIV. And he said, what's long COVID? How do you diagnose it? Uh, and people were pissed at him for he for apparently um, 
dismissing the disease. I don't think he was doing that. He was just saying it's not clear the extent to which is a problem. Now, clearly, a lot of people, as you say, even if it's 1%, that's a big deal. But also, um, how long does it last, right? Is it, is it going to last really a long time in 1% of the people? Yeah, that's a problem. But what if it goes away in three, four years, right? Which is possible. It's not great for the people, but it's better than not going away. I think there are a lot of unanswered questions about it. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what scares most people. When I see people with masks, I suspect that's what they're worried about. Maybe they're immunosuppressed and they're worried. You know, I see young people with masks and I think they must have an underlying health issue and they're, or they're worried about long COVID. Uh, Andrew's using mid journey, not, ch not free mid journey. Fascinating that you can make images. Well, you could always do that, but you could do it nicer and better now, right? Without any artistic talent. Oh, uh, watch Dr. G on the UK Challenge trial. I know you hate it. Funny how it confirmed the Pareto 8020 super spreader. Yep. Shedding day one positive with LFTs, airborne surfaces, etc. <clears throat> I thought the best information out of that was the 8020, which had been actually sorted out towards the beginning of the pandemic in a study out of University of Colorado where they had tested, you know, students on a regular basis and they found that 20% of them were responsible for 80% of the viral genomes in the population. Yeah. And I think the onset of shedding is interesting because people say, oh, Omicron is shedding quicker. No, I shed pretty quickly back with the ancestral, which they use with D six fourteen G, I think, yeah. I guess you're talking about Daniel on on Twiv, right? Okay. Uh, Patricia, a while back, I suggested as a guest, Dr. J. Heineke, HDL is inextricably linked to macrophage activation and host defense mechanisms. Wouldn't be surprised. All right, I'm going to write them down because I don't think I did last time. Dr. J. Uh, LDL and macrophages. You know, Cindy's a macrophage maven, Cindy Leifer. And uh, maybe it would be good and immune because we're talking about host defenses, right? So I will look into it. I know Dr. Offit thoroughly can covered the case for IPV in the symposium. Can you reiterate it for it in the U.S.? Is it that OPV and NOPV isn't zero for vaccine-induced polio? Yeah, I think that's it. I, I don't see... So Sabin, OPV has been delicensed. So right now we have no OPV products approved in the U.S. or licensed in the U.S., and OPV has not been licensed in the U.S. Some people are thinking about it, but I think that that's a mistake to be made. I don't think they should license it. I don't think we should be going back to OPV in the U.S. I why should we? Why should any vaccine paralyze kids? We have the technology to not do that, right? It's called IPV at the moment. So that's why I think as many countries as possible should use IPV. Now, it is an issue because you need a needle. Okay, so microneedle patches would be easier, but apparently the immunogenicity of IPV on a microneedle patch is not adequate. So that's it for that. Um, someone at the Philadelphia Symposium suggested a dose of IPV and then give OPV. Why would you do that? First of all, that one dose of IPV would prevent any paralysis caused by OPV, and then OPV would give you the great gut mucosal immunity, right? So people tell me we can't immunize the world with IPV because we can't 
give everybody needles mm. and so forth. So then you can't do IPV, OPV for the same reason because you're going to have to inject everyone. I don't see why you can't inject everyone with needles. Just uh, provide the needles. That's, so, um, but what we do need as Koistya Chumakov, I did a twiv with him, which you're going to really like. I, I got to release it one of these days. I'm not sure when. He said, we need new polio vaccines that are not causing polio. They're not infectious and give you gut, good gut immunity. We don't have those. And we need to work on them. Oh, but they're shutting down polio research. That's a problem. And Chumikov said, the bureaucrats are shutting down polio research. They think we don't need research on the virus, but we do. We do. We need to make better vaccines. Otherwise, we're going to stick with IPV forever, which in certain countries is not a bad idea, right? So the the, the other issue, if you listen to Kara Burns talk in the symposium, listen to Raul Landino and OPV, you know, they engineered very carefully mutations in the genome to prevent reversion. And what happened? The virus recombined with other enteroviruses in the intestine. All those modifications that they so painstakingly put in, that Gates paid $2 billion for, to put them in the virus and then to test them in people. Gone just like that with a single recomb a two recombination events. Take out the five prime end, or take out the three prime end with all the changes in the polymerase, and then the five prime end with its changes, and now you have a fully fit and virulent neurovirulent virus. So NOPV is not the answer. By the way, the make some of the makers of NOPV objected to my characterizing NOPV as a failure. So I did said them, well, come on Twiv and tell us why it's not. So you see, if people, if the right people, well, I should say, if people in the right way say I'm wrong, I'm willing to talk about it. But if you say you're wrong and I'm leaving, forget it. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay. Uh, how's that? What does that work? But you wrote it down. So I thought I'd just follow up. I don't mind you following up. The problem is Patricia. If I don't have my, um, uh, field notes. Who knows where it's written? I have a whole series of, of uh, sticky notes here. I have sticky notes here. And I don't see it on any of those. So then I was looking in my field notes. Go back a few days. I have a couple of people that I have to get on TWIV and TWIM. APHO Lab ID Con. Uh, no, I, I'm not seeing it, see? So I, wherever I wrote it, I lost, but I did write it now. It's right here. It's uh, J. Henneke, see? It's written in the book now. As long as I don't lose this, I'm, I'm will. i going to get in touch. I'm going to ask Cindy if she knows him. Yeah. Okay. Here's a link to one I put on the Discord server. One what? Uh I can't copy that. Nope. I'll have to do it. I'll have to do it some other time. Thank you, <laughs> Andrew. I've forgotten what it was. Where was I gonna go visit Hendra? No, I wasn't. I was just going to Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane. Brisbane's not near Hendra, right? No. Wait a minute. Brisbane's on the coast, right? There it is. I see. I know, folks. I don't know my. Uh, Australian geography. Um, Hendra is much northern than, than Brisbane, right? I'm going to search for for Hendra now. Let's 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 do directions from Brisbane <laughs> to Hendra. Hendra QL Queensland. Oh, look at that. Ah, where's Brisbane? Yeah, it's right next to it. <laughs> If it's the same thing. Yeah, it must be. Uh, so um, my apologies, um, Mandrake. 
if if I were going to Brisbane, then for sure I would have visited Hendra, go see the horse stables. In fact, the, the vet, years ago, the vet who took care of the horses emailed me and he said, I'd like to come on TWIV and talk about it. I never got him on. I'm really sorry I'm not coming. I'll be there another time. Okay, I promise. It's just, it wasn't, you know, it, it, uh, I can't leave this company for three weeks. I just can't do it. I, I like it too much. I want it to work. I don't want it to collapse. I like being on the noise, but I also like listening to off it for a long time. <clears throat> well, he can come on TWIV from time to time for sure and speak a long time. But um, uh, I, I, I think we needed a short format, and, and Paul is perfect. And you know, what better way to convince someone to do something? Say, it's just 10 minutes a week. Who's going to say no? <laughs> plus, plus, um, he gets a lot of eyeballs, right? So that's really good. Uh, did you have any dairy with dinner? No, I, I didn't have any dairy with dinner. Nope. It's gone now. It's just a... But, you know, it's interesting. It doesn't happen after everything I eat. I had veggie burgers tonight, right? It has some corn in it and whatever the veggie, they, you know, meatless stuff. And it's not very good. Excuse me, it's not very good, but I needed something quick. Uh, is anyone else's audio not synced? Is your audio synced? Uh, so, you know, I, I, do, I can adjust the, the, the delay, but it, it's usually an individual thing. Okay. <laughs> Andrew says, no problem. I'm on the other side of the world. Maybe that's why it's delayed a bit. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome for my straightforward talk. I never... I never uh, speak in a crooked way. I never try to mislead or misguide or lie or say something that's not true. Why would I do that? It would compromise my reputation as an educator, right? Raganiello said this, and it's wrong all the time. You know, he says things that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, if I talk about Brisbane and Hendra, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I can look at a map and figure it out. Alan said, being unbiased doesn't mean not coming to a conclusion. Yeah, that's, I believe that. Yeah, you, you can come to conclusions, but as long as they're based on the data, that's fine. All right, now, Coralie, you said you're not going to be around uh, after 2030. Uh, I don't like to hear that, but I will be there before 2030 for sure. I'll try and get there in 24 or 25. How's that? I promise. It's, I have to, and I'll do it on my own accord. I'll do a tour. I just need someone to arrange it because after TWIV 1000, I realized that I, I don't like to arrange things, events. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, I was surprised to learn that CDC has 30 countries, including the UK and Canada, for which travelers are recommended to get a single polio booster before visiting. That is correct. Mm-hmm. That is correct. Um, these are countries where polio is circulating. But you know what's funny, folks? Let me tell you something that's really funny. The U.S., the WHO put the U.S. last year on a list of countries with polio virus circulation. How about that? So if you want to visit the U.S. and you live in the U.S., you need to get a polio booster. Because um, polio virus is circulating here in the U.S. If you haven't been vaccinated, you know, if you can't remember that you had a polio vaccine, you should get it to live in the U.S. because we have polio virus circulating here. Uh, is it true that all vaccines eventually wane except rabies? Um, yeah, it, antibodies and T-cell 
levels always wane. The kinetics may be slightly different. And, you know, I'm going to show you a slide from, we're going to, we're going to switch to professor mode here. Yeah, it's office hours. What the heck, right? We're going to go to our vaccine lecture. What lecture was vaccines? Was it 20? Maybe. Oh, and look at that. It's actually um, downloaded on the draw. No, that's antiviral, so it's 19. All right, we're going to open up uh, vaccines. I'm going to show you the, the graph. Here it is. This is great. Vaccine screen share. Here, stimulate a protective immune response. So here on the y-axis, we have antibody prevalence and T-cell number. So that's your adaptive immune response. You get infected or you get a vaccine. Uh, within a certain amount of time, you peak in antibodies and T-cells, and then eventually it goes down. Or as you say, it wanes. I prefer contracts. And the, the kinetics depend on the vaccine. I saw a vaccine the other day being presented uh, where the, the, the antibody levels were high for many months. I mean, eventually they're going to go down because that's the way the immune system works. You can't have high levels of antibodies to everything you've encountered. Your blood would be like syrup. There'd be too many antibody proteins in there and T-cells. So it reduces to a low level, which is the product of memory B and T cells. In the case of antibodies, obviously, it's memory B cells. So that is um, the case for all vaccines. Uh, even rabies will go down. It's just a matter of when. Okay. Uh, okay, good. I'm glad you're giving no credence. Which antivirals and when would they be administered? Well, you could have had, first of all, we had um, remdesivir <clears throat> before COVID. It, it was there. It had been developed for Ebola virus. Um, so that could have been tested against coronaviruses and put through, through a phase one and been ready. Um you could have developed protease inhibitors, which is Paxlovid, right? You could have developed that before or uh, in multiple ones. So the protease um, and the polymerase are the two biggest targets. The polymerase is highly conserved among all coronaviruses, so you could have made polymerase inhibitors. It, it is not hard to do. You could have isolated RNA polymerase genes from a variety of coronaviruses that circulate in bats. You could have tested them for sensitivity. It would cost money to do that. Yeah, that's why it wasn't done. But if you had enough of those antivirals, when it, the, you get your first outbreak, you treat patients so they don't die, and maybe you, imp you impede transmission if, it, uh, if you get them early enough and you reduce viral loads. Yeah, see, universal M-pro inhibitor, it's possible. Sure, absolutely. Paxlovid is active against a number of other coronaviruses. It's not as potent as against SARS-CoV-2 because that's what it was engineered for, but it is certainly active against other coronas, yeah. Too bad we didn't have it before. Noir, thank you for your support of Microbe TV. Thank you for all the quality science. Cats at our rescue are the smartest cats in the world. Because they listen to Twiv and Twin and Puscast. Maybe I should call it Puscast. Yeah. Hey, did you like the latest Twin? The Alzheimer's and me melanin converting hormone. What an interesting story. And also on Immune. That was a good one. But you don't listen to Immune. But but Twin was great. Marianne, you have, you have spike shirts in no Norway. That's cool. That's very cool. <laughs> Uh, the oldest recovered virus is 40,000 years. Viruses have existed for, for probably a billion years. Yeah. I'm still masking everywhere. Zero respiratory viruses and allergies since 2020. I'm ready for any next wave pandemic. You know, it's if that's great. I don't want to mask. I can't 
talk properly. People, I can't see people properly. I think it's important to see people when you're talking to them, and a mask really cuts into that. I think we can do better than wearing a mask, but I get you. It's fine. A virus is currently causing human illness. Any idea which is the oldest? I think the herpes viruses are probably the oldest. It, it depends. So herpes viruses were around when the dinosaurs were here, right? 150, 200 million years. Now, retroviruses are probably four to 500 million years old, but those are retroviruses that infected marine animals. So, I mean, yeah, they're related to HIV, right? They're ancestors, so, but they're not as close to HIV as the herpes viruses were. So I, I would, you know, herpes, but you know, either one, 150, 200, 400 million years. Okay, in the comments section, all right. I never read the comments. I'm, I'm afraid to be insulted. I think the research paper published pushed fungi back to evolution like 1.4 billion years ago. Yeah, there would have been uh, so it was fungi at one point. So that I wonder when the first cells would be. Then, I don't, when did first cells arise? How many billions of years ago? Oh, life on Earth arose four billion years ago when cells formed. Yeah, four billion. Wow, <laughs> four billion years. So. There were single cells of other types four billion years ago. Cool. Uh, lab leakers never provide sequencing data of phylogenetic trees. M most recent common ancestor explanation of lineage A and B and only speculation. Absolutely. But if you tell them these things, they say you are lying or you're misrepresenting. It's just BS. Total BS. I mean, even Sachs, right? Jeffrey Sachs. He said, well, this market is the epicenter. He said, it's all a lie. What kind of BS is it for him to say it's a lie? It's, it's data. It's not a lie. Unbelievable. And in Norway, no talk about the lab nonsense. Good for you. <laughs> it's just great. <clears throat> Hello, Steph. Welcome. It's okay. You're here. Got another hour or so. John, thank you for your support. Still on my trek to watch all the old twibs available on YouTube. It was cool to see Nels talk about Minnesota and an episode with a smart lady from Madison, Wisconsin. That would be uh, probably Ann Palmenberg. Very smart. She was. She's in the symposium video. Um, is it was it released today? Um, yes, the one released today. Russian roots, <laughs> and we have a blooper video which is going to be released at the end of the series. <laughs> what is the Instagram called? It is. Um, at P R O F V R R here. It's right here. Uh, actually, there are two accounts. So, Prof V R R is the one I started first, and then we have a microbe TV account. So, all the episodes get posted to both, but when I post a picture, I post it to Prof V R R, although then I have someone who probably takes the picture and reposts it on microbe TV. So, yeah, the comment, the content is more or less the same, although the people are different, right? <laughs> I'm reading Premonition by Michael Lewis. And all the characters, have you heard of any of them? Well, Joe DeBlisi, that's takeoff on Joe DeRisi, right? Carter Meacher and Charity Dean. I don't know what those are based on. Let's look it up. Who is... Carter feature based on uh, 
Oh, well, he was medical advisor for the public health company. He's a real person. Yeah. So I guess Joe DeBlisi is a real person. <laughs> I don't know any of them. Joe DeBlisi. Um, I don't, there's no Joe DeBlisi. Maybe it's Joe de Blasio. Maybe the spell checker got you. No, I haven't heard of any of them. Hmm. How has the surveillance efforts surrounding the H5N1 virus evolved since its emergence? And what potential preventive measures have been identified to mitigate its transmission and impact? Well, it, it, surveillance for influenza has always been uh, very good. Yeah, Joe DeRisi, I know, uh, Patricia. He is a... Uh, virologist at UCSF, and he was actually on TWIV a while ago, talking about viruses and snakes. He's the only one I know, yeah. Anyway, Steve, back to you. Uh, the, the surveillance is very good, right? They, they surveil uh, wild birds, and, and then when when uh, farmed birds get sick, they go in and, and do some surveillance as well. So we have a good flu surveillance network. So w preventative measures. Well, you know, when a flock gets sick, it's cold entirely to stop the transmission. There's not much you can do about birds flying around, wild birds in particular. Um, you know, the, the best thing with farm birds is to keep them inside, and then the chances that they're going to be infected is, are much less. But small farms, they don't do that. Um, we do have antivirals against influenza virus, and they do work against H5N1. And H5N1 vaccines are... mRNA vaccines are in development. So I think we could respond pretty quickly to all of this. Yeah. So lovely pandemics and climate change are totally po politicized, for sure. A absolutely. Totally. Because the public is polarized, right? They are polarized one way or the other about masks and vaccines and <laughs> SARS-CoV-2 origins. And so you take advantage of it. I am running for office and I don't think you need to wear a mask. I don't think you need to get vaccinated. And clearly came from a lab, they will say, and get votes. Now, I, I got to be careful what I say. Someone could clip that out, right? <laughs> and say, Rack and Yellow said that. That would be really crappy. I got to be careful. Yeah, I'm not coming to... Uh, Andrew got it wrong. I, I'm not coming. I decided not to go. But next year or the year after, I promise. Okay? Promise. You're not supposed to cross your fingers when you promise. I'm, I'll come. I promise. And and um, when I go, I'll go to New Zealand at the time. Yep. What a pleasant surprise I thought Professor Vincent was taking this week off. Well, first of all, thank you for it being a pleasant surprise. I appreciate it. Uh, last week I was somewhere and couldn't, I don't want to miss two weeks in a row. So I'm here. And, uh, you know, you can go to microbe.tv slash calendar, I think, and you could see the, uh, the uh, schedule of, of what's going on. So next week, I am, um, you know, I'm at ASV, so I'm not going to be able to do office hours. But then the following week, the 5th, we, we will resume. And then I'm here for, you know, July and August. So you got no missed uh, office hours or Q&As. I, I am supposedly going to Vermont in August. So... And then in September, all, it all hits the fan and I go all the, over the place. I wish I had enough money to take a tour of the f Titanic on a fake sub. I donate it all to you instead. Oh my gosh, Christelle, we were talking about this today. These people who paid a quarter of a million dollars to do this. I wish they could give it to Microbe TV. They would survive then, right? I hate to, you know, have them die, but... It's not, if the, the sub only went down a few times and 
my gosh, if you have a lot of money, does that mean you can risk your life? Oh boy. I wish Joe would stick to bow hunting, saunas, and ice baths. It's a disaster to have him not understand preventable diseases considering his reach. He's got huge reach. People think he's God. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. It's really something. Um, I don't always agree with you, so I am very much not withdrawing my support on Patreon. <laughs> Intelligent discussion is the breath of life. Yes, Elizabeth, I noticed you don't always agree with me, and you make it well known that you don't. And I'm happy that you don't leave because you disagree with me. Because that's, And I'm not mad at you for disagreeing with me at all. That's the breath of life. Yes, absolutely. Just follow me on Instagram. Thank you. I appreciate it. I enjoy Instagram. What's the best way to measure if imprinting is happening with the boosters? Oh, so you, you vaccinate and then you wait two weeks and then you take blood, you make serum out of it, and then you do a neutralization assay with uh, older strains like ancestral and maybe delta and alpha and then o Omicron. And You know, the, the Omicron may be different enough to induce XBB 1.5 responses. And you can see that by doing the neutralization assay. That's the best way to do it. Yeah, that's the best way to do it for sure. And it's not hard to do. So you take um, serum two weeks after vaccination with the booster. And I'm sure the companies are going to do that. They have to. They have to get good data. Yeah, for sure. Elise followed me on Instagram. Hello from North Carolina. <laughs> North Carolina, where are you in Chapel Hill? You don't have to tell me. It's okay. Um, I've been there a few times. Yeah, I should have all these links up. Uh, someone gave me an app for my phone that it's like a business card, and you can scan. The, you could send it to someone else, and they get all your contacts. You can there's a QR code that you can use. What is it called? I can't remember. Anyway, so I have, Karen is now working with me. She comes on the road. She comes to the incubator and helps out. She does really a lot of good stuff. I'm, I'm very happy with her. And she's trying to reduce the, she said, the stuff that's not science to get out of my head, to take care of other things. So thank you, Karen. Yeah, it bothers me how many subscribers Rogan has also. He spews all this nonsense to them. I would go on and just talk about what's real and not real. I would go on. I don't have to debate anybody. Ridiculous. How long do you think we have some immunity after we've had COVID? A few months. Well, now, Patricia, it's, it's a little nuanced, right? So a few months after you have had COVID, you have very nice antibody and T cell levels, okay? And those start to decline within a few months, and they go very low. The antibodies in the T cell go low. But you have memory versions of the B cells, which make antibodies, and the T cells. Okay, two different kinds of cells that do two different things to fight COVID or SARS-CoV-2. Then if you should get infected again, those memory cells are going to respond right away. In a couple of days, they're going to be making a lot of antibodies and a lot of T cells. And that's going to keep you out of the hospital. It's going to keep your disease mild at, at worst. Unless you have a comorbidity, unless you're at risk, unless you're over 75, in which case it could, you could still get in the hospital. And in that case, you, if you test positive, you might want to consider taking Paxlovid if it fits in your um, you know, medication scheme. You have to talk to your doctor about that. But the immunity, high immunity will last a couple of months and then it's low and then you depend on a memory response. And, and before the memory kicks in, this is the key. It's going to be a few days. So the virus is going to reproduce. You're going to have some symptoms and you're going to shed. But the idea is the memory will kick in to prevent severe disease, prevent the virus from getting down into your lungs, for example.
YouTube recently suggested for me a clip from Joe Rogan where he had Roger Penrose as a guest and talked about Goodell theorems. Biggest nope ever. I'm sad that Penrose went on his podcast. Hmm. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> Be like that time when Bill Nye went to the Creation Museum. People like Lex Friedman and to a lesser extent Joe Rogan make me think of the difference between clever and intelligent. Yep, that's true. Well, Bill Burr cut Rogan down when he started his mask garbage. Rogan just giggled while sucking on his cigar. He's just a provocateur. That's the thing. Yeah, he's going to giggle. And then his people will love it. Um, yeah, just make fun of the truth. So if I want, went on, he would be giggling the, <laughs> the whole time. He'd probably infuriate me, right? Ay, ay, ay. Hi, the Microbe TV Discord has been going well. Yes, I understand we passed a thousand participants. That's great. I'm really happy about that. Will you be going to the Rocky Mountain Laboratory in uh, in Hamilton? I haven't. Um, I haven't got plans to go. No, I was there three times in the past years, actually. So. Probably not going to go for a while. If there's another pandemic, your subscriptions will skyrocket. Yeah. I do not want there to be another pandemic just so my subscriptions will skyrocket. But you're right. Fortunately, there's not going to be another one like this for a long time. There will be other pandemics, which will be less serious, but not the mother of pandemics like this. I, I, 50, 100 years probably. That's my prediction, but I could be wrong. But I've resigned to the fact that I have to make this company work uh, without disasters, without exaggeration, without lying, without obfuscation, just presenting the truth. And I will have <laughs> passed from this world knowing at least that I said true things and um, educated a lot of people. It's the best that I can do. I think we can we can still make this company work, although I'm becoming less convinced that very wealthy people are going to help. I think you folks, with your small donations, which are much appreciated, are going to push this company forward because now that the pandemic is over, the wealthy people are... Not so worried anymore about being healthy. Vincent, I was pointed to your Lex podcast by a scientific-minded family member. I listened to you a lot after that. They, however, went with he's big pharma rep since they no longer agreed. I'm actually not a big pharma rep. Um. Just so you know, you know, I don't get any money from Big Pharma. In fact, Pfizer wanted to pay me to make podcasts, and I said I would do them, but you can't pay me, so they're not paying me. And they're saying at the beginning and the end, Dr. R and Dr. G, Griffin, are not getting compensated. I'm happy to spread the word, but and you can use my educational skills. It's fine, but I'm not taking money from you. So if that that's what I said earlier. If people want to use taking money to try and get me, they're going to fail because that's one thing I don't do. But it's easy, right? It's easy to say, oh, you're a shill. You're a farmer shill. Oh, I used to listen to a podcast. I'm not even going to tell you the name of it. It was a pretty good tech podcast. And they were saying some things at the beginning of COVID that were wrong. So I wrote in. It was about vaccines, even before COVID. And the host said, oh, he's a pharma shill. Just ignore it. 
It's the end of that podcast. So that's a case where I did leave because I couldn't stand to hear them anymore. I didn't write to them and saying I'm leaving, though. No. I just threw out the subscription because, boy, what a stupid thing. Pharma shill. You don't even know who I am. Hmm. Advice for an aspiring virologist. Read a lot. Read as much literature as you can. Read a good virology textbook. Listen to This Week in Virology. Surround yourself by people talking about viruses. Go to virus meetings and read a lot of papers. In my view, most students of advanced sciences do not read enough. And they, you need to do that. You really do. Because the literature is, is where it's all at. In particular, go to the older literature. <laughs> uh, John's allusion is to the opening of Howl. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving. Debate Rogan and you'd get one million subscribers faster. No, I don't think I would. I went on Lex. Lex got me to 100,000. So maybe Rogan would get me to 200,000. It is not. It is not worth it. I would not debate him. I'd go on the show and talk with him. But he's not going to debate me. He can't. He's going to suck on his cigar and giggle, right? But that's fine. I don't need to debate him. He could just let me talk for three hours. <laughs> I could do that easily. I did it with Lex. <laughs> Beyond the noise should be used by the CDC. Never. They will never use something that is not their own product that they can't control. And yes, Mimi and Richard Farina were really, really good. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, bivalent is just one. It's no longer bivalent. It's monovalent. It's just XBB.1.5. Yep. I think all pediatric recommendations so far have been to get three. We could look it up, right? CDC, COVID, vaccine. It's really complicated. There are a lot of... There are a lot of uh, different things we can go. There's different routes. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> what what age do we want to know? Age six months through four years. I don't know. Uh, it's part of a standard vaccination schedule. Okay. Well, what's the standard vaccination schedule? I'm sorry to, to look at this. Read the recommendation. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, birth through six years, blah, blah, blah. Um, oh, this is all vaccines. Look at that. This is a nice figure. COVID-19. How many doses are we getting? Number of doses recommended depends on your child's age and the type of vaccine used. Okay, see, it's not even uh, harmonious. Anyway, for the monovalent that's now XBB.1.5, the CDC is going to tell us what to do because the FDA does not recommend make vaccine recommendations. The CDC does that. From the latest beyond the noise, the next is the next monovalent will be given yearly only to susceptible. That's what Paul thinks should be done. Um, I, I, you know... Um, he doesn't always agree with what the CDC says. But it's also possible that it'll be given to everyone over six months of age to give you a booster every year. And they may look at the circulating strain and adjust it every year, a la influenza. That's the thing. The bivalent vaccines are EUA only according to the manufacturer's websites. That's why I was asking about flu vaccines because they change yearly. Yeah, but they're very... The bivalent was a EUA because it's, it's a bivalent, and the other one was a monovalent, so it was a different vaccine. But the flu vaccines, as I said, were are minimally 
millimilli changed. Rob, thank you for your contribution. Always a pleasure. The fungus abides waiting to go viral. Office Hour guests have been a hit. I just wish that Amy would select one for a Q&A with A and insert guest initial here. Okay, I don't quite, a Q&A with A and, oh, so have someone other than me. That would be fine with me. I don't mind. don't like the idea of being ill for three to four years. I don't blame you. It's fine. I'm just saying. it's a. It depends what's important, right? I mean, I get a respiratory infection now very rarely. I had COVID once. I haven't had anything else in the past three years. It's okay. That's fine with me. But it depends on your health, right? It's all up to you. Reports of persistent antigen after COVID infection correlates with long COVID besides replicating viruses. There another explanation. Sure. Remember, it's a correlation. It's not a causation. You need to prove it. Or devise a treatment that gets rid of the persisting antigen and show that the LC goes away. I don't know how you do that. But you know, lymph nodes hold antigen after the infection's over. And that could be slowly leaking out into the circulation. Uh, there could be antigens hidden in various tissues. They're just hidden there, they're not cleared, and they gradually leach out. So it doesn't have to be virus replication. If you want to say it's virus replication, you have to show infectious virus, which nobody does. Just having antigen is not enough to prove. And I'm telling you, all this comes by, back to bite people in the end. So many studies have fallen by the wayside where they say, oh, there's replication because of the PCR copy number, and it's wrong. You have to look at infectious virus. So, I yes, so the answer to your question is there are ways that antigen can persist in the absence of virus replication. And, I mean, but... It could also be replication, but I haven't seen any proof that it is. It's all indirect. And, you know, these kinds of claims require substantial proof, I think. But if I saw data that supported it, I would tell you. I haven't seen it yet. Nothing good. Some still are masking in public, like a friend of mine, unable to stand down due to mental health issues, others for caution, but using ineffective mask types or wearing them wrong. I, I do see maybe a few percent of people masking, and most of them are wearing the masks incorrectly. That's right. You know, it, it, they, it's unfortunate. They should wear them correctly because they have a full sense of security, right? Uh, Marianne says, what if people in countries where needles are possible got first IPV, then OPV? Would it help at all? Well, here's the thing. If you can use IPV, that's going to prevent paralysis, right? And that is the goal of the vaccination program. The real issue is whether you want to stop circulation or not. So in the U.S., we have poliovirus circulating because we use IPV. I think in Norway, you'll probably use IPV. They certainly do in, in Sweden. So you have circulating virus. And if there's anyone who is not vaccinated, they're at risk for getting polio. So if you want to take care of that, then OPV might help. But remember, even the gut immunity with OPV doesn't last forever. It's a transient gut immunity. So you are still able to shed virus. Although exactly how much, I don't know. Those studies really have not been done. So in countries that can handle needles, I don't think it makes much sense to follow IPV with OPV. I um, mean, uh, OPV is great in countries that can't use needles or can't afford them, right? But it's got this paralysis issue, and so I, I don't think that's acceptable.
movement to not vaccinate children at all. I know people who are pushing that never have before. It's awful. It, it's these kids are going to get sick. They're going to some of them are going to die. They're going to get diseases that are completely preventable. I don't understand why people don't get it. Uh, D- D- Daisy, you like uh, Beyond the Noise? We'll keep it up. Don't worry. I love it. The only show I ever canceled was uh, Urban Agriculture, Dixon's Baby, because he wouldn't get guests, and it wasn't my show. He was supposed to do it. Don't want to be not nice to Dixon, but it really was his job to get content. That was the deal. Uh, Tom, poly recombination with other antros fascinates me. I know there are papers. I will do some reading. It's very pervasive, Yes. Every time you take a polio vaccine, it recombines. So in retrospect, not a good idea to develop infectious uh, oral polio virus vaccines. Is recombination a type of horizontal gene transfer? Yeah, it is. It's from one virus to another, right? Sure, I, I think that's a good way to look at it. Can you elaborate on the current Methods for culturing noroviruses. What are the major obstacles and how have recent developments helped to overcome them? So there are a couple of ways you can culture noroviruses. One is that you can uh, culture them in, in human B cells using bacteria or bacterial products to enable growth. It's a little bit... Um, Difficult to do that. Or you can use intestinal organoids. So you take stem cells and differentiate them into these cultures that have a a lumen that resemble the lumen of an intestine and some layers of cells that resemble uh, the layers in an intestine. And um, and then you can use that to grow the virus. And and a number of labs do that, yep. Uh, The the obstacles were that it just didn't grow before. And it turned out that one approach was to add bacteria. So everyone would take stool filtrates, people with norovirus diarrhea, filter to remove bacteria, and then they would put the filtrate on cells, and it never grew. And then once they forgot to filter, and they put the bacteria on, and, and it grew. So you need some component of bacteria to facilitate growth in B cells. And then at the same time, people said, we have this organoid technology. Let's try that, and that works as well. Could you elucidate more about the potential threats of vaccine-derived polioviruses? So vaccine-derived polioviruses have always been an issue. When you immunize kids with oral polio vaccine, it's taken by mouth. The virus reproduces in the gut, and the virus, the vaccine viruses revert within days, and the, the kids shed revertent viruses. Sometimes the child can get polio, but more commonly a contact gets polio. Uh, And then those viruses can transmit in the population. And whenever immunization drops, you can get outbreaks of polio virus caused by these circulating vaccine-derived strains. Now, if um, you do mass immunizations, which is what Albert Sabin advocated, you immunize everyone at once, you don't have this issue because everyone's vaccinated. But more recently, we haven't been doing these mass campaigns. Now, and by 2016, it was noted that type 2 polio vaccine caused the most um, vaccine-associated disease. And in, by 2016, there were no more wild cases of type 2. So type 2, wild type 2 was declared eradicated, and the type 2 component was withdrawn from the vaccine. But then there had been some undetected wild type 2 polio circulating in Nigeria, in the northeastern corner of Nigeria, Boko Haram. And that got out and started to spread. So what they did is to go in and immunize with monovalent OPV. And that reintroduced type 2 into the population. And then since then, we've had huge numbers of type 2 associated paralysis in Africa. And OPV was designed to try and eliminate uh, OPV, vaccine-derived OPV2, circulating uh, vaccine-derived type 2. And it doesn't completely solve the problem. It hasn't eliminated it, and it can cause paralysis itself, and we'll see if it circulates. So that's where we are. 
the strategy right now is to make NOPVs one, two, and three, but I don't think that's going to work. And I, um, if you listen to the symposium videos, you'll hear more about that. What a great answer. I hope some philanthropist group sees this in IPVs, the word world for events. Hmm. Okay. We would miss you if you no microbe TV podcast for three weeks. I would miss it. I'd have withdrawal, right? <laughs> that would be a problem. But I, you know, I don't want to do that. Um, I promise, I made a promise, a pact with you to provide education. It, that doesn't mean taking time off. No, don't need any vacations. I travel to do podcasts. That's my vacation. It's not a vacation, but it's, that's what I love. And I'm happy doing that. I don't want to stop it. <laughs> New debunk the funk. Joe Rogan's worst misinformation yet with RFK Jr. I guess we have to have both of their names, right? If a pet would get in a fight, could you take it to an emergency vet and get a rabies vaccine that day like a human would? A fight with another animal like a raccoon? Yeah, I think you could do that, yeah. But not a vet. Uh, Lisa would love to see more on veterinary and human tick-borne disease microbes, vaccines, therapeutics. I see one from Pfizer for tick-borne encephalitis called Ticovac. That's great. You'd like to see more content. Well, we have a, a vet on the show. So um, we can do that. Uh, Angela Mingarelli. I'm sorry, Coralie. Uh, uh, I'm, I'll get there before before you have issues, okay? Early in the pandemic, there was a belief you could be in contact for up to a total of 15 minutes with people and not get infected. Looking back, does it make sense? Uh, yeah, it depends how much they're shedding, right? Because we know now that 20% of the people are the, are the ones that transmit 80% of the infections. So if this is a low transmitter, a low shedder, it could be that you could be there for 15 minutes and, and never... Uh, uh, get infected yeah so it makes sense mm -hmm. masking elevates my cortisol makes me feel awful really that's interesting huh as someone who works in a supermarket i have no idea how the shelf filling staff manage to wear masks and do their work some things are very difficult yeah the icing on the cake from the RFK Jr. episode was him not understanding hydroxychloroquine about two hours in. I had just seen the lecture on endosomal acidification and tempers too recently. You know, he should watch my videos. No, why he wouldn't? I wear a medical grade mask every day for work. You eventually get used to it. Some people don't tolerate them well. I suppose I got used to them also. But I do... Um, like not wearing a mask. Although here on the stream, I never did because I'm in my basement all by myself, right? Okay, about dismissing boosters. So, okay, YC, you don't have to be antagonistic. We can talk about this. Hoping T-cells will save the individual. What about public health policy for $340 million? Do you think that giving everyone a vaccine, a booster every three months to keep antibody levels high is good public health policy? Do you know what good public health policy is? It's a, it's a policy that at most everyone will take up. Do you know how many people are getting boosters? Less than 50% because they don't want to go every three months and get a booster. There are some people who are going to do that to keep their antibody levels high, but it's not sound public health policy. We can do better. That's what I'm saying. Don't just take the easy way out and give everyone a booster because it's not going to work. Most people are not going to get it. And so what you're saying here, less spread, confident, and healthier society, that's wrong. If most people don't get the vaccines, how is it a less spread in confident and healthier society. You're forgetting the fact that it's not a good public health policy. We can barely get people to get one vaccine in their lifetime, and yet every three or four months. No, that's why we are against it. And even with a booster, after three months, you're going to get more severe disease if 
the variants are changing. So we need to do something better. Maybe universal vaccines. Yeah, don't just fall back on a booster. Just think of all the stuff we missed in the 4 billion years before we evolved. I'd love to know what happened, yeah. Uh, now that you are 70, you started classifying elderly as 75 plus. All right, YZ. It wasn't me that did. The Paul Offit said it yesterday, 75 and up. It wasn't me. And anyway, I don't fit in any of the categories. And screw you about ego, okay? <laughs> Joe DeRisi, right. What's my favorite microphone? Ego, right. What's your favorite microphone? Um, this, this is not bad. This, it's a road podcaster. It's okay. But the one at my studio is a Heil PR40. I really like that. My earphones are wired. I have in ear buds that are that are wired. I don't use wireless as much as I can avoid it. Some good news in the UK: COVID is currently only involved in about two percent of deaths. It's a massive drop. It's still a lot, yeah. Has Paul Offit or anyone for that matter discussed the potential outcomes in people receiving every COVID booster? Nope, as far as I know. We don't know what negative outcomes there might be. As I said, very few people are getting all the boosters. Some people get them very frequently, uh, and uh, most do not. But, um, you know, Paul has mentioned if, if you constantly induce antibodies to a particular antigen, it's possible as those antibodies differentiate by somatic hypermutation, you can make some that are autoreactive. So that's one, and Paul has mentioned that. But more or so, it's the idea that you cannot get people to come every three months and get a booster. Even every year, the flu vaccine booster, half the population gets it at best. It's not good for public health policy. Okay, that's the point. Science aside, it just doesn't work. So if you have a vaccine and no one takes it, what good is it? Fix it. Make a better vaccine. <laughs> Since Sachs is pontificating about SARS-2, will I give macroeconomic lectures? No. I, I do try to stay in my lane. And I, when I talk about vaccines, I'm talking about it from a scientific viewpoint. All right? And so I'm not giving medical advice. You, you all should talk to your doctor if you want to know whether you should get the vaccine or not. I tell you what the science says, and I haven't seen any science that says boosters have really helped in terms of severe disease, and that's the bottom line also. Oh, on the nature of science, the archive of the Royal Society from its inception in the 1660 has been digitized and accessible online. Do write it up and send it in as a pic. That sounds really cool. Would love to see that. Uh, the calendar, unfortunately, is not always up to date. I'm trying to fix it. Yes. I think I worked on it today on the train. So um, I think it's it's more or less up to date. Ted, the 21 Harvard study showed a correlation between wildfire activity and COVID cases and deaths, but no cause and effect. Are any viruses, however, actually spread and find particulate matter in wildfires? Well, it's possible that you know, with the high winds involved, that they could carry viruses. But I think the temperature would inactivate infectivity. And so I would think that that 21 study is just, is not causation. So I think it's a hard one to do, right? Is there an easy test finding out if someone has antibodies? Yeah, there are commercial tests you can take. I've had, we've had people write in who say, 
they check their antibodies all the time. And when they go low, they get another booster. I said, there's some people who are willing to get boosters all the time. If they want to do that, it's okay. Is there a pan corona vaccine in the work? Yes, definitely. There are multiple ones. Not easy. Nobody's ever made a pan anything vaccine. But we do have some good ideas and technologies now. And so, yeah, the, a bunch of people are working on it. Lex said this week he was going to invite virologists on soon. I hope they include good ones. I hope so. Um, I was certainly on a couple of years ago, so I don't need to go back. But maybe I should write to him and make suggestions. You know, he always on Instagram comes off as being, wants to talk to everyone. But then if you make suggestions, maybe he won't listen to you. I just don't know. Who says us folk aren't wealthy? Sorry. You're right. As soon as I said that, I realized that some of you might be wealthy. But uh, I'm not getting donations from people in huge quantities. $10,000 and more. Not happening. That's what we need to survive. I, but no, it's not going to happen. So I'll depend on smaller donations. We'll just get more and more people. Or if it doesn't work, we scale down the operation. So it's, it's, all, it's all there. <laughs> If you want people, wealthy people interested, started this week in longevity. Yes. I had a donor once say, if you make me live 10 more years, I'll give you a million dollars. I wondered, you want, do I get it up front or do I have to wait 10 years? In which case, it's all off. I'm not waiting 10 years for that, right? <laughs> Thank you, SRR for your support of science education. This is the best thing you can do, folks, is to support us uh, week in and week out. Paso Robles, the home of some of my favorite vineyards. Heather, I listened to Lex and Rogan, and I love Twiv. I honestly think Rogan just doesn't recognize his bias, doesn't know what he doesn't know. A good, compassionate communicator could soften his stance. I could. I told you I will go on and calmly talk to him and correct him, but he's got to stop giggling and sucking on the cigar, right? Uh, so if you want to suggest that to him, Heather, I'd be happy to have you do that. Mimi Farina is Joan Baez's sister. That's right. I remember that from the old days. Yep. <laughs> Our cat got some vaccines today. Feels included. That's just great. That's just great. Having said that, I'd love to see Vincent and Amy baffle him with brilliance. Oh, my God. Amy would bite his head off. I don't think that he would like that. The child has had COVID. Why would they need three doses? Got to look at the, they have recommendations for all the different possibilities there on the CDC site. But yeah, it, it, scientifically, you, you shouldn't need three. Two plus an infection should be enough. That's what the science says. That's what the science says. Not MDs, but a science. I think if, this is to Heather, but I think if Rogan and Racaniello had made under different circumstances, they would have liked each other, and Joe wouldn't be making the faux pas he is now because of their friendship. Maybe. You know, Lex Friedman, when, when I was on Lex's show, in the middle of the recording, he gets a call. It's Joe, Joe Rogan, he's, and Lex says, I have to take this. And he goes across the the room and he's talking to Rogan and then at one point he says, hey, Joe, I have Vincent Racaniello here. Do you know him? I heard him on the phone. Lex said, you should have him on your show and nothing ever happened. He should have. I could have gotten him soft science. I could be calm with him and say, look, Joe, this is the way it works. But Vincent, isn't this true? No, Joe, it doesn't work that way. Here's how it works. I would be really calm, okay? I see a comedy the Rogan and Racaniello show. Joe is the zany stone conspiracy guy, and Vincent is the straight man. <laughs> <beat by laughs> That's very good. And I do like your icon there. What a cool purple cat. Yeah. Uh, taking on the Rogan show would get a lot of people to hear you that would not otherwise listen. 
I will go on this show. I'm just not debating anyone. I'm just going to teach him science for three hours. How's that? Which is what I did with Lex. Antigen comes from translation. Transcription, DNA to RNA, that's transcription. And then the mRNA to protein is translation. That's where the antigen comes from. Can antigen persist without RNA? Sure, as long as it's in a place where it's not getting chewed up, right? Like a lymph node, it could persist. Yep, yep. My last polio booster was 2001. It's still effective, yes. You don't need any more. Oh my God, somebody in my kid's new school or across the board, no vaccines whatsoever. Well, that sucks. You should protest that. You have to protest. You have to be vocal. You have to go to meetings and say this is wrong. Hmm. And um, tell them to listen to TWIF, yeah. Is it measles that spreads by the air at a very far distance? Yes. Um, uh, measles can get in the smallest uh, particles, droplets, and, and go very f long distances. Yep. With a viral vector like AstraZeneca vaccine, does antibody stop it working? It can, yes, it can. Although uh, that's the results with adenovectors in um, COVID vaccines, in some cases there was not as much interference as they thought from antibody against the vector. But that's always that's always uh, been a concern. Yeah. <laughs> What is the substance that the RNA is suspended in at the center of the COVID virus? Why would I tell you olive oil? I would never say that. I wouldn't. No, it's not olive oil. It's, uh, you know, this is very small. So we're talking about probably a lot of water in there. Hmm? And some other molecules that are related to, you know, the parts of the cytoplasm when the when the virus is built it's capturing parts of the cytoplasm so it's an aqueous solution it's a water-based solution with a variety of proteins of different kind what's my favorite movie about viruses Uh, I don't really have a favorite movie about viruses. I do like the one, uh, I don't even know the name of it. The, 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 the star was this, a female and she kept getting virus injections and it made her very powerful. It, it, it was just a, so far out, it was horrible. But I don't really like any of them. Um, contagion is not bad. It's the best of them all, really, in terms of accuracy. But I would say it's not a favorite movie, no. Um, we can almost finish these questions here. Lots of revelations in the realm of Huntington's lately. I'm sure we will. The, the folks over there who are picking the papers, definitely. If not, I will um, recommend it to them. <laughs> thank you Lisa I got your donation I really appreciate it um, I really do appreciate it isn't this an enduring legacy yeah it's going to go on forever some way I will get it to work for sure be calm in science I think that's really good be, I'm going to write that down Questella and I'm going to send you one okay tell me what size you want Questella be calm and science. Um, I missed one here that I have to take and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Um, as someone scratching the surface, I'm curious, how would you like your work to be remembered and what do you envision as your enduring legacy? So 
I want to be remembered as someone who revolutionized the study of RNA viruses by making uh, infectious DNA copies, the first infectious DNA copies, and by making the first transgenic mouse model. So I want to have a scientific recognition. But more importantly, I, my enduring legacy is that I made podcasts and I wrote a textbook and made videos to teach the world about viruses and microbes and parasites and more. That's what I want people to remember because I've done what few scientists have done in, in other fields they have, like Carl Sagan has done similar things. But in my field, nobody has done this. And I think it's cool. And look at what we've done tonight. We have a live stream with uh, 200 people and we're bantering about viruses. I think this is damned cool. And that's what I want to be remembered for, that I basically turned my efforts from research to this and it works. Okie dokie. Teaching virology to Rogan would be like NDGT pulling him out of moon landing conspiracy. I think I could do it. I have patience. I have patience. I heart microbe TV. Thank you very much. All right. Let's see what we have here. I think it's time. Uh, keep calm in science. Keep. Okay. We'll make it keep. Anyway, in the uh, spirit of being calm and educational and just talking to one another and dealing with differences of opinion, um, we're going to wrap this up. Hey, we, had a, we have 198 people, 179 likes. Let's bring it to 200, please. We can do it before... Um, we end this. Peter thinks I'm the Carl Sagan of virology. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. I want to thank our moderators for tonight. We had Les. We had Steph. We had Tom. We had Barb Mack. I think she's uh, gone to sleep there. Um, and we had Andrew. Thank you all for moderating. I appreciate your efforts for sure. Thanks to all of you for coming. Hit the like button. Come on, the number hasn't gone up yet. I'm not stopping this stream until you get over 190 because that's how many people you are. Uh, next week, we won't be here. I will be in Athens, Georgia. So not going to do a stream next week. So, But in two weeks, we're back. And then we're back every week for the rest of the summer. So thanks for coming, everyone. Good. We got to 195 likes. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming, everyone. Have a safe two weeks. See you next time. Good night.